Creationists have rather few new arguments. Instead, they rely on numerous, outdated prats and blatant fallacies to promote a narrative that gives not a care for the truth. Here is one place where we can clearly see that. This will be an investigation of the creationist argument that new kinds cannot evolve, that there is a limit to the amount of evolution or variation, as they call it, that disallows the gradual change from one kind to another. To do this, we'll look at the word kind, followed by an investigation of such an impossible transition of forms. Then. We'll end by evaluating the argument that there is a genetic barrier preventing one kind from evolving into another. So, the word kind, as I've pointed out elsewhere, has no taxonomic value. It has no consistent definition, and no professional biologists use it to classify anything. Don't take my word for it, go see for yourself. Kent Hovind describes a kind as the reproductive boundary of a population, which is what the biological definition of species similarly entails. He says this in our conversation. John Woodmerap describes a kind as being equivalent to the genus level in his book Noah's Ark, A Feasibility Study. Ken Ham describes a kind as simultaneously a family and order in his debate with Bill Nye. And, as I show in Response to Evolutionless Chapter 3, Georgia Purdom says there is a dinosaur kind and a bird kind, meaning that kind can be defined as either superorder or class also. The fact is that the Bible doesn't say what a kind is, or a sort for that matter so creationists have to invent the definition. However, there's a hang-up. The number of kinds has to seem reasonable enough to fit on Noah's Ark. Thus, creationists must fit their number within a space constraint. Hoven departs from the other creationists in lowering his definition of kind to species because other creationists see that many millions of terrestrial animals would have to fit on the Ark. They also recognize that speciation occurs, whether in African cichlids, or Culex mosquitoes, or Incitina salamanders, so every speciation event would result in the evolution of a new kind through a purely naturalistic mechanism. Potholer54 addressed this issue in his video, Potholer and Hovind Come Together, Not Like That. Link in the description below. Immediately, that presents a problem for them. If kinds can change according to the creationist definition, then how could they shift the goalpost for us evolutionists? Don't know what I mean? Well, generally, when creationists ask for a change in species, they're not actually interested in that species change. You can mention any of the aforementioned examples, but the creationist is immediately going to respond with, that's not a change in kinds. Okay, sure, but creationists rarely ever define the word and expect you to give them an example that fits their definition when they often don't even have a definition. This is blatant dishonesty. Now, what about a change in kinds? Since there's no definition, I'm going to present the transition from one clade to another. However, this transition will be so obvious that I imagined even a creationist would call it one kind becoming another. The transition in question is that of the evolution from fish to amphibians. I would spend this time discussing the reptile mammal transition since it's possibly the most complete lineage of any two classes in the fossil record and has withstood all creationist criticisms, see evolution slam dunk, but I covered that in early mammal evolution, link in the description below. Thus, without further ado, let's jump right in. So what are fish? Fish are defined as gill-bearing aquatic craniate animals that lack limbs with digits. Not too difficult. Fish are descended from fish-like chordates, that is, animals that have a notochord, dorsal hollow nerve cord, pharyngeal slits, and a post-anal tail, such as Cathamyris and Zongziniscus. The first vertebrates were nearly identical to these guys, but possessed some minor differences that would eventually result in major consequences. A rudimentary vertebral column. Malaconmingia and Hykuichthys are currently considered to be the earliest vertebrates at 535 million years ago. Now, try to picture these guys. They had no fins aside from some dorsal fins, nine pairs of gills, and cartilaginous vertebra-like structures. This is a far cry from most fish today who have paired fins, most fish have five pairs of gills, and they have bony vertebra. The origin of the vertebra isn't difficult to infer. Very early vertebrates have what you might consider partial vertebral columns, and this is derived from the notochord and dorsal hollow nerve cord found in all chordates. There is even a proto-notochord found in the Cambrian cephalochordate pacaya. And, 
Why the notochord arose in the first place isn't difficult to infer either. Paleontologists have theorized that it arose because it is advantageous in both being rigid enough to provide good muscle attachment while being somewhat flexible for swimming. Gills, on the other hand, could simply have reached the optimum number as fish evolution progressed. In other words, none of this required magic or miracles and could have proceeded entirely by a Darwinian mechanism such as natural selection. Moving on, all jawless craniates are grouped into a single paraphyletic clade called agnatha, which means, wait for it, without jaws. The earliest of these still had no fins, including lampreys, hagfish, and conodonts, but they had teeth. Teeth appear to be derived from the same structure that scales are derived from, which fish have plenty of, and this has been revealed by research focusing on the early Devonian armored fish Romandina. So, teeth have a simple Darwinian mechanism too. Thus far, we've discussed how basic notochords, gills, and teeth could have all come into existence and diversified through simple Darwinian selection. Don't worry, this trend will continue. Within Agnatha, fins also developed. Remember that the earliest chordates didn't have fins, and the origin of fins has been revealed by Evolutionary Developmental Biology, or EvoDevo. The 2009 paper, Shared Developmental Mechanisms, Pattern the Vertebrate Gill Arch and Paired Fin Skeletons, describes how the developmental process that gives rise to gills allow the development of paired fins. Later armored fish, including cephalaspidomorphy and teraspidomorphy, had fins as do all jawed fish. All jawed vertebrates are known as nathostomes. Speaking of jawed fish, how did jaws develop? EvoDevo has similarly come to the rescue here, revealing that jaws are derived from the first pharyngeal arch. This has been described by the 2004 paper, Evolution of the Vertebrate Jaw, Comparative Embryology and Molecular Developmental Biology Reveal the Factors Behind Evolutionary Novelty. So, at this point, we've come a long way from our protochordate starting point, advancing all the way to early jawed fish. Some very early fish include the Acanthodians, first appearing in the early Silurian, which are ancestral to sharks as indicated by such finds as Doliotis, described by the 2017 paper Pectoral Morphology in Doliotis, Bridging the acanthodian chondrichthian Divide. For the bony vertebrates, or Osteichthians, on the other hand, they are descended from placoderm-like fish as indicated by the 2013 paper A Silurian Placoderm with Osteichthian-like Marginal Jaws. From there, some basal Silurian fish, such as Lophosteus and Giyu, indicate the arrival of Osteichthians, but the group split around 430 million years ago to form the clade of Actinopterygians and Sarcopterygians. Actinopterygians are known more commonly as ray-finned fish and constitute almost the entirety of modern bony fish. The overwhelming majority of fish you can think of, whether goldfish or trout or sturgeon or cichlids or eels, are ray-finned fish. Now, a note on lungs, as they will become important later. The origin of lungs evidently found itself in simple air pockets that formed in the esophagus that aided fish in gathering oxygen in low oxygen zones, as shown by the 2016 paper, Did Lungs and the Intracardiac Shunt Evolve to Oxygenate the Heart in Vertebrates? The pockets closed in most ray-finned fish to make their swim bladders, while they remained open to form the lungs in sarcopterygians or lobe-finned fish. Some primitive ray-finned fish still have lungs, having branched off before the pockets closed off, including bichers, gars, and bowfins. Teleost fish, though, first appearing in the late Permian, are characterized for the most part by their swim bladders. But we won't continue with the ray-finned fish. Instead, we are concerned with the lobe-finned fish. Remember that ray- and lobe-finned fish split during the late Silurian. Paleontologists have found several basal lobe-finned fish, such as Mimania, Acoania, and Saurolepis, continuing the seamless transition of forms most beautiful. About 420 million years ago, at the start of the Devonian, our lineage split from the coelacanths. These lobe-finned fish have been long described as living fossils, but don't let that deceive you. These fish have had a very rich history of phenotypes. More derived than them are the lungfish, who split from our lineage about 415 million years ago so named for their amazing ability to spend long stretches of time out of the water, even though quite a few fish can leave the water for periods of time. That leaves Tetrapodomorpha, all sarcopterygians with internal nostrils. We recognize modern tetrapods as amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. However, a number of ancient fish have characteristics intermediate between the earlier sarcopterygians and the later tetrapods. 
one of the most important being the layout of the limbs. As the tetrapodomorph clade progressed, fish became increasingly tetrapod-like. Just look from Canichthys, important for having the earliest identified internal nostril, to the Rhizodonts, especially Sauripterus, to Gogonasus, with its tetrapod-like middle ear and precursors to the radius and ulna, to Eusthenopteron, with its labyrinthodont teeth, which were, by the way, a group of primitive amphibians. Its skull roofing bones were similar to those of tetrapods, Acanthostega and Ichthyostega, and its distinct humerus, ulna, radius, femur, tibia, and fibula. At this point, we've stopped about 20 million years prior to the origin of true tetrapods. We're still dealing with fish. As time went on, the pectoral fins of tetrapodomorphs became more and more like true tetrapods. Tinerau has both fish-like and tetrapod-like characteristics as described by the 2012 paper, A Marine Stem Tetrapod from the Devonian of Western North America, and Pandorichthys has a tetrapod-like humerus and even the first hints of digits in the form of radial bones in the fins, as described by the 2008 paper, The Pectoral Fin of Pandorichthys and the Origin of Digits. Then, we meet Tiktaalik, whose transitional features I described in the video Early Mammal Evolution. Might I remind you, dear viewer, that Tiktaalik was predicted years before it was discovered. And why? Because evolution makes predictions that can and have been verified, while only crickets can be heard from the creationist side. At last, we meet the earliest tetrapods, such as the late Devonian Elgin Erpaton. Conventional wisdom held that the earliest tetrapods were land dwellers, but we now know that this isn't true. The earliest tetrapods still lived in the water, so they weren't amphibian in the strictly scientific sense. That is, they didn't live in both land and water. This extended through Ventastega, Acanthostega, and Ichthyostega and into the early Carboniferous. Notice that nowhere in the evolutionary development of limbs did I have to invoke magic to jump any hurdles, nor did I have to do it anywhere else in this video. Which brings me to the last point I want to make today. Remember, my initial points were to demonstrate the absurdity of the creationist notion of kinds, to show a major transition, and to confront the creationist idea of limited variation. This last argument has no support from creationism other than an assertion and a misunderstanding of a simple process. The assertion is that genetic variation is limited. Sure, in one sense this is true. You can't just smash a random assortment of genes together and expect a functional organism to result. The misunderstanding, on the other hand, refers to artificial selection. Creationists love to say that breeders can only breed up to a certain point, but that all organisms are sterile beyond this nebulous point. The problem here is that breeding animals has already caused large variation in phenotypes. Just look from wolves to dogs. If we were to apply this to the transition we just investigated, then where would it go? Is it genetically impossible for protochordates to evolve notochords as an adaption to their environment? If so, demonstrate how. Is it genetically impossible for gills to shift towards an optimum number over time? For teeth to evolve from the same process that makes scales? For fins to develop from gills? For jaws to arise from the pharyngeal arch? For lineages of fish to split? For lungs to descend from air pockets in the esophagus? For internal nostrils to develop? Or for limbs to develop piecemeal over generations? Where in any of these processes do creationists draw the line? Creationists are hopelessly, nay, hilariously, behind on answering any of these questions and yet dismiss the entirety of this evolutionary process without a second glance. But such is creationism. Now though, you have three different methods for addressing the creationist argument that new kinds can't evolve. <sighs> Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.